Good morning. Good to see you guys this morning, and if you are worshiping online, uh, good to see you. Thanks for tuning in. I was looking at uh, YouTube and, and our Facebook, and it looked like there's uh, 250, 300 people uh, tuned in online or different households, so thank you for that. Grab a Bible. Let's open to 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 2. Hold your spot there. We're in a series called Transformation. And we've been talking about uh, what it means to really understand following Jesus because everybody wants to go to heaven, right? We're going to have to do better than that. It's like, I don't know. Everybody wants to go to heaven. In our minds, we separate what it means to go to heaven from what it means to be transformed. In Scripture, the two are not separated. To choose to follow Jesus is to choose to be transformed into the image of Christ. If you want to go to heaven, you choose transformation. But our minds do that in separate steps. So what we, how it looks in life is we choose to go to heaven and continue to live any way we want to live. We're never really changed. And we call the process of transformation discipleship. And our plan for discipleship is this, Right? Uh, This is the pickle tray. This is the overall plan. If you're new here, this is what it looks like. You turn it over. This is the ice tray. We have a name. It's the ice tray. Different shades of ice. This is what the quadrants look like as we grow spiritually. Life, spiritual life begins with spiritual birth. It's right there at the top. We move from spiritual birth to spiritual infancy. This is all very biblical. What do we expect from an infant? Show up and read. Just show up and listen. Come to worship, men's group, women's group, listen, and then just start reading your Bible. That's all we want. Uh, The responsibility for an infant is on us, not on uh, the child. And then we move from infancy into childhood. And when we get into childhood, we want to continue to read, but then we begin to connect and to engage spiritually. We move from an infant to a young adult, and ultimately from a young adult to a mature adult. That's the plan. Keep that with you. That's where we'll be for the next couple of weeks. Our mission statement is this. We learn about Jesus in order to live like Jesus so we can lead other people to Jesus. Pretty simple. Pretty simple. Uh, we do that through those four stages. And today we're going we're gonna to really focus in on that, that stage of spiritual childhood because that's where we do begin to live. If infancy is about listening and reading, then childhood is where we begin to live out what we have heard and what we have read. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2 says this, The things which you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Would you pray with me? Father, thank you for our time. Uh, thank you for those people who got out today. Father, for those who are online, thank you that they've chosen, Father, to, to discipline that time and to be a part of this. And uh, Father, may their engagement be great also. Uh, teach us today. Father, may we have those spiritual light bulb moments, Father, where uh, the pieces of our spiritual life begin to fall into place where we really understand what this looks like, uh, where we take, Father, positive steps toward being transformed into the image of Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. So spiritual growth is cumulative. Now, what do I mean by that? It means that each stage builds on the previous stage. Uh, I remind you that if you study Scripture, you see that spiritual growth... uh, follows biological growth, that the examples that the Bible often uses for spiritual growth come from the biological world. Spiritual birth, born again, natural birth, you got to be born right, infancy, spiritual infants, all of that is very, very biblical. But here, here's what biological life looks like. What you learn as an infant, you build on as a child. If you don't do a good job in infancy, you limit where a child can go. Likewise, what is built on in childhood is built on in adolescence. And if, you, if you're lacking in your experiences in childhood, you will be lacking when you get to adolescence. And then adolescents become young adults, young adults become median adults, and it goes on and on. It's very clear. You want a mess, get those out of order, right? The clearest example of a mess that most people can understand is the person who marries the 40-year-old who's still living like they're 16, Right? The Peter Pan syndrome. You never grew up. Right? I thought you were fun until you quit paying bills. Right? And, 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 and it's a mess. It's chaos. Because there's a very clear order. And adolescence is not a part of a 40-year-old's life. Spiritually, the same is true. 
What we have previously learned becomes the foundation on which we build what we are now learning. So we have these boxes up here. And uh, these boxes correspond with the quadrants that we have. So in the first quadrant, man, we're going to read, we're going to get in in God's word, then we're going to connect with other people in God's word, then we're going to serve, and then ultimately we lead. We progress through them in a very logical order. But man, church life can get very difficult. And I'm going to show you what happens in a lot of churches, right? Everybody wants to get involved. We show up at church, it's fun, and because we lead at Tinker or we lead at the office or we lead at the school, we think, I am a natural born leader. I bypass everything else. I go straight to leadering, right? And here's the truth. How are you going to lead? These are going to fall at some point. It's okay. You're going to lead like you lead at Tinker. You show up at church and you're thinking, now, I know how to lead. I'll, I'll just lead like a lead done at the office. I'll lead like a lead over to school. Well, here's the problem. You're leading like you've always known to lead, which is not like Jesus. Because who you are naturally is not like Jesus. You have to learn to lead like Jesus. So here's what church looks like for 90% of the churches out there. We get this stuff all set up here, and we do it in any kind of crazy order that we think will work basically however I want it to be. And it'll never stay stable. It'll never stay stable because the foundation wasn't solid. Now, hear me. That describes most of your church experience in small churches and churches that were desperate for leadership. And I'm not bashing small churches. Hang on, let me rebuild this thing. Nothing like dead time online, right? Okay. Here we go. So here's what small church looks like. I pastored them. Right, we're desperate for leadership. You show up and you can do anything. The last question I'm asking you is how much time you're spending in God's word. Because I'm desperate for bodies. I'm desperate for people to teach. I'm desperate for, for people to serve. I'm desperate for deacons. And so what we end up with is we end up with lots of people in, in, in situations where they haven't matured to that point and you've got a church problem just waiting to happen. And a lot of you will go, I just came from that. Or I understand that. The other thing that should be happening to some people is you should be realizing that you were elevated to this place without ever establishing this foundation. Is that you came into the church and because you were grandfathered in from another church, you were a deacon at another church, you were a teacher at another church, you show up, but you're not spending time in God's word. And and listen, in all humility, what you should do is look at your life and go, you know what I need to do? I need to go back and reestablish my foundation. I kind of need to start again. I want to build on a solid foundation. That's what the Apostle Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. He says this, According to the grace of God which was given to me, like a wise master builder, I laid a foundation. And another is building on it, but each man must be careful how he builds on it. So we spend time in God's word, which is the foundation on which everything else in our spiritual life is built. Look at me, look at me, look at me. If I could give you one thing, this is what everything else is built on. Spending time in God's word. And then we move to connecting, serving, leading. Number two, we never abandon what we have previously learned. We just add to it, right? You you don't do this. Well, I've read my Bible for three months now. I'm ready to quit and move on to connecting. No, that is not how it goes. We read our Bible and we connect. And when we move past that into serving, now we're reading our Bible, connecting, and serving. When we move past that into leadership, is these are all built on top of each other. The clearest illustration I can tell you of that is math, right? The first thing you learn in math is really numbers, how to count. Watch this. You can't do anything if you don't know how to count. You can't do multiplication, you can't do addition, subtraction, you can't do calculus, you can't do algebra, you can't do geometry if you don't know what the numbers are. So it starts with the foundation. But even math and, and addition and subtraction, you think, how simple is that? You can't do any of those if you don't know how to add and subtract. Is that every stage builds on the next stage, and so you, the better you learn this stage, the better you're going to do in that stage is that they're cumulative in nature. When we struggle, this would be the second best thing I'd tell you today, when we struggle, we go back to how we began. That principle holds true for everything in life. I need you to look up here at me and get it. 
This, this has life-changing ability. When we struggle, we go back to how we began, to the foundation, to the fundamental issue. So let's, let's just stop for a second. Let's talk sports. I don't care what sport you're in. You start to struggle. What your coach, if you've got a good coach, is going to do is tell you to go back to fundamentals. If it's baseball and they're paying you $50 million a year to play baseball and you can't hit, they're going to put a tee in front of you and give you a bat and say, hit that ball off the tee. You're going to do the same thing a five-year-old T-ball does because fundamentals work. And we go back to fundamentals. Football, track, it doesn't matter what it is. You go back to how you started when you struggle. So let's talk marriage for a second. People look at each other and go, I don't feel like I used to feel. I don't think I love you anymore. And a real simple thing to do in your marriage is go, are we doing what we did when we felt like we were in love? Well, he used to tell me I was beautiful all the time. He couldn't believe how beautiful I, well, are you still telling her how beautiful she is? We used to go out on dates, man. We'd go out and watch a movie and have a meal. We ain't been out on a date in 62 years or whatever. Right? Hey, hang with me. You want to feel like you used to feel, do what you used to do. Right? Do what made you fall in love. Talk like you used to talk. Go where you used to go. Do what you do that made you fall in love. Because, listen, unless you just made a horrible mistake, you chose them. There must have been something you loved about them. Go back and reestablish how you began. Now, let's talk about childhood. Expect a challenge in childhood. The number one characteristic of childhood is self-centeredness. When a baby comes into this world, uh, they are convinced that everything is about serving them, loving them, and giving them what they want whenever they need it. A baby does not wake up at 3 o'clock in the morning and go, hey, you know, it's a little early to be crying. I think I'll just hold off. No, they go, I want what I want when I want it, and I want it now. And I'm going to scream this sounds like church, doesn't it? I'm going to scream till I get it. All right, we're going to get there. Just hang with me. Why does a baby do that? A baby does that because it's self-centered. Because they believe they are the center of the universe. So watch this. This is so good for all areas of life. Maturity is the process of learning that you are not the most important person in the world. That applies to every age group. You can be 60 and think you're still the most important person in the world. Maturity is learning you are not. If you're raising a child and they're, they're waking up in the middle of the night and crying, you've got to get to a certain point in life where you go, you're just going to have to cry because I'm important too. <laughs> I need some sleep. And, uh, and they start learning that they are not the most important person important person in the world. So you're, you have a little child at home and they got a million toys at home and they got this one toy they're playing with. And a friend comes over, maybe a cousin. This is what it looks like at our house. It's a cousin. And of the other million toys that are strewn everywhere in that house, that cousin picks up a toy. Your kid will immediately drop the toy they have, focus all their attention on the other one millionth toy that that kid picked up and go, mine, I want it. Why? Because they're selfish. They believe that everything in life is about them. They believe that everything in life is for them. So let's talk about church for a second. People in church who are crying, this has to be mine or my way, that's an issue of maturity. You don't have to get angry about it. Nobody gets angry at a baby and goes, you stupid baby! Why'd you wake me up in the middle of the night? No, you just look at it and go, that's what babies do. You don't, you don't have to get upset about it, right? Or, or that's mine, I'm going to take it and go home. Okay. We understand what it is. It's an issue of maturity. So the question becomes, why not stay that way? Why not stay at that stage of life where everybody in life gives you what you want? Meet your every need. Where you are the center of attention. Well, life will go on without you. So here's what, here's what we learn, um, that self-centeredness works against connecting with God and others. Every week we stand up here and we echo the fact that we believe the Bible teaches 
that we were created by God for a relationship with him and others and quality of life is determined by it. Look right here at me. Show me somebody lonely and I'll show you somebody self-centered. Because you can't be self-centered and have great connection with God or with other people. Let's just talk God for a second. You're going to have a great connection with God. You're going to have to give up some of your time. But if you're self-centered, you can't do that. So it sounds like this. I don't have enough time to read the Bible. I know, it stings. But that is what it sounds like. It's what it sounds like. And, and if you don't have good relationship with other people, it's because you don't have time to prioritize other people in your life. And that's how friends happen. You know what the scripture says? A man who has friends must show himself friendly. That means you prioritize other people. Is that we are dying to ourselves as we pursue relationship with God and with others. Connectedness is the result of living an other, others-focused life. So in the spiritual stage of childhood, we begin to learn that life is about serving and engaging. What is serving? Serving is prioritizing the needs of others above my own needs. Engaging is very much like that. It's making someone more, else more important than yourself. So what does that, that look like? What well, looks like the great commandment? To love others as you love yourself. Make them that important. But the picture that I want you to have burned in your mind about what, what connecting and engaging looks like is Jesus in the upper room. Outside of the cross, Jesus in the upper room would be the one picture of Jesus mo most people would quickly go to to remember him by. So let's talk about that for a second. Uh, the disciples get up there in the upper room. They've been out traveling all day. Nobody washed their feet. Okay, the job of the lowest servant in the house, the doulas, was foot washing. You're going to understand why in a second. Right? The worst job you could have as a household servant was the foot washer. It says the supper being ended, I think that's interesting. You'll find it really interesting once uh, you understand what this foot washing thing was about. Jesus got up, dropped his robe, took a pail of water and a towel, and he got on the ground, the Son of God. And he picked up the feet of his disciples and he washed them. Now, what I'm going to tell you about that will change how you view it forever. So these guys are all wearing these big, long robes. What did they wear under the robe? How about nothing? It's just a big, long robe. And where do we live? Palestine, it's 187 degrees, right? And what do we do? We sweat. We sweat off the nastiest parts of our body. And it all runs where? Downhill. And we're walking through the dust. And the sweat off the nastiest part of your body accumulates on your feet and the dust of the road turns it into the nastiest mud you can imagine. And I love the fact that Jesus let them lay there with their feet in each other's face and eat before he washed them. That's why when you went in somebody's house, the lowest slave in that household met you at the door and says, we washing them nasty feet before you come in this house. But the Son of God... Jesus picked those nasty feet up, held them in his hand, and washed them. Then he said, do you know what I've done? You call me master, but I washed your feet. That's what engagement and servanthood looks like. In the spiritual realm, the challenge comes because the old part of me is dying. Uh, we, don't, we don't like to die. This made me uh, stop and think about it. I, why is it that we don't want to die? Um, why is it we fear it, we try to avoid it, we run from it? Um, I think part of it is we are not convinced that death ushers in something greater. Right? Um, I mean, I've, I've probably been, unless you're a mortician or a doctor or something, I've probably been with more people who've died than probably anybody in the room. It, it is not entering in too easily. Even for people of faith, right? It's the last enemy that we face. It's tough. Unless you are convinced that what death is ushering in, you into is greater than what you're leaving behind. 
And that changes everything. It's where I'm going is better than where I've been. What I'm getting is better than everything I had. And then you can start to go, kind of looking forward to this. Kind of looking forward to it. One of the oldest ladies at the church stopped me after the last service. And she was talking about her Bible reading plan. I said, we're looking three years out. We got one of our staff members writing something for our children in three years from now. And she looked at me and she said, I hope I'm here for it. She took a step and turned around. She said, no, I don't. She said, I'm ready. I'm ready. Here it is. That's going to bring me something greater than I'm leaving behind. Now, here's what Jesus tried to say, and, and really get this. Jesus tried to say, not only is that true in physical death, it's true in spiritual death. That there is a life that is available to you in this life that is greater than any life you've known, but you've got to be willing to die to get it. That what I'm offering you is greater than what you have. But what we have is so cool. Look at all this, the stuff we enjoy and all the stuff we do and how great it is. And so we hold on to that tightly. And Jesus said, if you want to know the life that's even greater than that, you've got to let go of that. Dying is hard. It is hard. But what I offer you is greater than what you know. If you'll just be willing to die. Ephesians 4.20 says this. That, however, is not the way of life you learned when you heard about Christ and were taught in him accordance with the truth that is in Jesus you were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds and to put on the new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Childhood is also the age of discovery. Childhood takes a long time. It's about 10 years biologically. Again, keep remembering biological life parallels spiritual life. Spiritual growth does not happen quickly. We do not come in and go, I've read my Bible for three months. I'm ready to be a deacon. We do. We, we get it. Um, but that's not how it works. Spiritual growth is a slow process. Just like biological growth is a slow process process so what are the four goals we want to see happen during the childhood phase of spiritual growth number one and this is probably the one we miss most is our identity in Jesus our identity in Jesus what does that even mean uh, well this world will work very very hard to give you an identity so uh, it will tell you that your identity is based in money, that if you have a lot of money, your identity and your value is greater than people who don't you know any people with a lot of money that are jerks do you? Uh, maybe are you? No, I'm just, uh, here, here's what I'm saying. All the money in the world didn't change their life. Here's what the Bible would say. Sometimes it even makes you more jerky. Right? And less like Jesus. So money's not the solution. How about pretty people? You ever met any pretty people that are jerky? You meet pretty people who are trying to get prettier? Yes, thank you. <laughs> And the, prettier be, and the prettier they become, the jerkier they get. So watch this. Look at me. Think about what you're pursuing. That pretty isn't the answer. Talented people? Talent the answer? No. But the world will try to tell you these things. The world will try to tell you, man, here's where your value is. Here's where your identity is. Let us determine it for you. Let us determine it for you. Listen, if you haven't figured this by, out by now, is one day you're going to be ugly. You live long enough, ugly will get you. Right? So here's your options. Die or get ugly. Right? So if all your eggs are in the basket of pretty, you're bankrupt. You're bankrupt where you sit right now. You're bankrupt. If that's where all your eggs are. Are you following me? So what do we do? We want to get value. We come right here. To truth. What does the truth say? Do you know how much Jesus loves you? The book of Psalms tells us that every tear you've ever cried, he took a bottle, a stinking bottle, caught your tears and put them in it so that he would know how many you cried. The hairs of your head are numbered. That he knows when a bird falls to the ground, how much more valuable to him are you? Right? 
The reason we bite on all this stuff in the world is because we don't know what the Bible says about our identity in Jesus. That we are sons of the everlasting living God. That's our identity. So we discover our identity. We said this in an earlier series that, that um, our identity in Jesus is revealed as we pursue him. Our purpose and our identity are revealed. Number two, our spiritual giftedness. 1 Peter 4.10 is each one has received a special gift. Employ it in serving one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Each follower of Jesus has received a spiritual gift from God that is used in service of God's kingdom. Gifts are not talents. Right? You say, I can sing. That's a talent. You can sing before you ever met Jesus, right? You don't get saved and all of a sudden go, oh, where'd that come from? Right? No. No, that's a talent. Now, a gift may determine how you use your talent and where you use your talent. But that's not a spiritual gift. So we discover, now here's, here's what pastoring looks like. You talk to people who've been in church 20 or 30 years, they don't know what a spiritual gift is. Not a judgment, just an evaluation. You say, that's me, Pastor, because nobody ever taught me, nobody ever asked me, nobody ever challenged me. Go to the hub today and pick up a spiritual gifts test. Start the journey. I want to know how God created me, what he gave me to use in his kingdom. Pick it up today at the hub, fill it out. You'll look at it and go, that's me. That's where I find my joy, my fulfillment is doing those things. Third thing. Our passion. This is the thing that makes your blood boil, right? It's the thing that gets you. I love people. I walk around the auditorium every Sunday looking for people that I don't know so I can go talk to them. I always tell them, I start with this. I don't have good boundaries, so I'm about to ask you questions about you that may, you know, surprise you. But I want to know who you are. I want to know your name. If you've been around here long, I'll look at you and go, I might have to ask you six or seven times, but I'll eventually remember your name. Why? Because that's the passion God gave me. I love people. Your passion may be foster care. You may weep because the idea of a child not having a home breaks your heart. Right? It may be sex trafficking. Uh, we're at the hub of I-35 and, and I-40, one of the highest sex traffic places in America. And maybe that breaks your heart and that's what your passion is. Maybe your passion is, is what teenagers are going through. Or maybe your passion is rocking a baby in the nursery. God puts something in your heart that burns and no matter what you do, you can't get away from it. That's passion. Fire. There's a crazy verse in, in the book of Jeremiah. Jeremiah was a, a prophet, a preacher, who was going to preach, and nobody was going to care. That's a horrible existence, to want something so badly, to preach it, and nobody care. That's why the other book he wrote is called Lamentations. It means weeping. It was a sad life. So he tried to quit. He got so frustrated, he tried to quit, and he wrote this verse in Jeremiah 29. But if I say I will not remember him or speak anymore in his name, then in my heart it becomes like a burning fire. That's it. Shut up in my bones. And I'm weary of holding it in and I cannot do this. That's passion. Jeremiah was saying what is in me has to come out of me. Childhood is about discovering your giftedness, your identity in Jesus, your passion, which all leads to your purpose. And that's why God put you here. That is why God put you here. When it all comes together, then we understand why God put us on this planet, that our life, and hear me, we're about done. My life is not about earning a living. Everybody's got to earn a living. Everybody does, right? Don't use Jesus as your excuse to be lazy. Everybody's got to earn a living. But that, separate that from why you're here, right? You may make a living at Tinker in the school. You may make a living in any number of ways. But why did God put you on this earth? How are you making an eternal difference? Because he's using your life. That your life is about more than a check. A bank account. A car that's already wearing out. That your life means something. That's identity, giftedness, and passion which end up in, pur in, in purpose. And lastly, we will wrap this up with childhood is the stage of life where we begin to contribute to family. Uh, those families where only mom and dad are contributing, mom and dad look really tired. Because in the design of family, family was designed to be a place where everybody contributed and everybody was a part. Uh, as a matter of fact, when that doesn't happen, let me show you what mom and daddy start to look like, right? You get these angry outbursts, right? Right? Nobody in this house does anything. 
There are clothes everywhere, toys everywhere. I'm the only one in this house that does anything. You ever hear a preacher sound like that? Oh, right? See, when, when we're in a place where everybody's not contributing, it leads to frustration. Some of the most frustrated people in America are guys in the pulpit and they're screaming at people like parents who are trying to carry the load alone. Are you with me? With me. So by design, the family was uh, designed to be a place where everybody contributed, and, and so is, is church. As you mature, you take on more responsibility. You move up this ladder, this is about responsibility. Until you get to the place, back to family, where you've matured to the point where you can have your own family. Side note, we're sending people out who don't know how to do that. Back to this message. Because we're not doing the, the maturity process. Contribute here before you go out there and try to contribute because a nightmare is to join your life to somebody who's never contributed. That's a nightmare. So you go, well, pastor, how are we going to close this thing? Typically, this is where you make people feel bad for who they are so that you'll get them to do something, right? Built for guilt. Um, it's, it's a horrible thing to do because it never results in long-term change. Uh, long-term change is intrinsic, I changed because I wanted to. So I need you to hear what this church looks like now and get, give you a good picture. Uh, every week in our five worship services, about 2,000 people gather. That's children, teenagers, adults, everybody. We have eight full-time ministers. Eight. Actually, I think we have seven and one, one part-time, and then we got about four uh, part-time associates for 2,000 people. I, I challenge you, find any other church running that many people with that few ministers. And, uh, and, so, and so if you were having consultants look at it, they go, it's impossible. It's impossible. You can't do that. So how do we do it? It's this. Everybody contributes. We couldn't do it if you weren't contributing. I don't mean money. I mean this stuff. Man, so many people have bought into this. I am overwhelmed at the response we've gotten from a church body that says, I'm going to get in God's word. And what does that lead to? That leads us to connecting better to each other. Some of the best relationships you'll ever have, even better than your blood relatives, will be found in this spiritual body. I promise you. I promise you. And then that leads to serving, looking at somebody and going, wow, what can we do for you? And that'll ultimately take you to leadership, right? So here's what I need you to hear. I'm proud of you. I, I, I could not be more proud of any people I've ever pastored in my life. I am proud of you, but you're not my kids. You're not. You're his kids. You're his. And I'm going to tell you, when we walk through this process, when we grow, when we learn responsibility and maturity, the Father, your Father, is well pleased. Would you bow your heads with me? As, we, uh, as we've done this uh, series, what happens is people start to look at their spiritual life and, and they begin to realize that um, never really been a moment in my life when I've had a spiritual birth that resulted in a, a growth process through infancy, childhood, young adulthood. Um, I, I just, I don't know that anybody ever explained what this was supposed to look like and, and I really don't know that I know Jesus and Boy, today, Matthew or Vic or myself would love to have that conversation with you. Elijah's here. Uh, just love to be able to talk with you about what it looks like to follow Jesus and, and to be transformed. Uh, others of you are going to go, Pastor, I got stuck. And it really frustrates me. I look back on my church life that nobody ever sat down with me and explained how this is supposed to go. Basically, I put my name on a card. They dumped me in some water and said, see you in heaven. And I fought the same old battles with sin. Nothing about my life changed because nobody ever explained this stuff to me. And pastor, I need, I need to start. I, I need to begin this process. And would you pray with me? That's what our ministers are for. Or maybe on this day when, uh, when it's so cold, a lot of people worship from home. You got out, you're here. Maybe, maybe there was a reason behind that. Maybe you needed your church family to pray for you. And that's what we're here for. This is our time of response. You can come forward with any, any need, any concern God's put on your heart. This is our time to minister. Father, thank you 
for loving us well. Father, thank you for this church body and what a blessing it is to so many people. God, I thank you for what you're doing and look forward to what you're going to do even right now. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>